Hey everyone, this is Sharaba. I'm a new channel and I plan to make videos about things I find cool like icebergs, true creepy stories, unique mysteries and more. In this first video of mine, I'm going to cover the ultimate iceberg of the unexplained, unsolved and bizarre made by you slash illegitimate time lord. Which is like super massive. I mean, look at this. I feel like I'm going to have to split each tear up into like you know, three to four parts. So this series could have like 24 to 32 videos, which is pretty insane, but I've got it too because it's so cool. I feel like there's like a lot of terms that if I searched up could put myself and you guys in danger. So while I try to cover up the entire iceberg, there could be ones that I won't cover. And if those ones come up, I'll put them up for the ones who feel dangerous enough to research it. But isn't it kind of scary though to think that there's like things if we searched up could literally put us in danger? I don't know, it feels kind of weird. Either way, enough with the talking. So go relax, get some water, some celery. Uh, what? I don't even like celery. I don't know why I said that. I like tomatoes though, so go get a tomato and let's get into this iceberg. I hope you all enjoy it. Okay, so first off we have 11BX1371. I thought this is going to be like some really obscure hard to find thing based on the name, but it wasn't really. And of course not because this is literally the first term in tier 1. Anyway, um, it was a video from early 2015 that had some guy in like a black plague doctor costume just moving around with a buzzing noise in the background. It was originally sent to GadgetZZ.com which from what I saw is a tech news website so weird and they thought so too. They published it titled this creepy puzzle arrived in our mail where they mentioned they received a weird CD from Poland which had numbers and letters on it like a product key but upon examining they said it was clearly like a puzzle. Also, I find it kind of weird that they got some weird creepy CD and they still decided to play it. Like, I would not put that in anywhere. So, the reason it's more of a puzzle than just some creepy video is one, the numbers and letters on the CD, but also that the person seemed to be blinking in Morse code. The body language also could have been some more subtle clues. Some people from around the internet decided to analyze it and came with some pretty creepy answers. So, first off, the reason the video is even called 11BX1371 is because encoded description on the disc's menu was found to be that. Some people also noted that the video's audio kind of sounded like I would love to kill you being repeated over and over again. Another user created a spectrogram of the sound and found both text and images concealed within. The former had one in plain text just straight up saying you are already dead. The rest were enciphered. The images depicted women being mutilated and tortured. This being the case, many fear that the creator could be a serial killer, but that died down quickly after discovering the images were just from like different horror movies. Some people analyzed the plague doctor's costume to be like a symbol for bioterror. One message's plain text read, the eagle equals infected will spread his disease. We are the antivirus will protect the world body. Another read, strike an arrow through the heart of the eagle. The year 1371 was also suggested because that was the year the Black Death was ravaging Europe. There were a lot more theories as to what this all meant, but it could have not meant much because the person calling himself Parker Warner Wright revealed himself as the creator and said to those who had been working to decode the tasks that you are no closer to understanding the message. But it has a bit of a wholesome conclusion maybe, saying that it had been his intent that people work together to break the codes. Quote unquote, not one individual could decipher the whole, so all he wanted was for people to work together as a team. Just kidding. Maybe. I don't know. So like the last one, since it's like a random, you know, bunch of letters and numbers, I thought this one was going to be hard to research too, but I should learn by now. We're literally on the first tier. Anyway, so uh, this one is a Reddit mystery. In early 2011, a user by the name of A858DE45F56D9BC9 created a subreddit with the same name. The posts were long combinations of uh, random letters and numbers that were uploaded daily. At the start, it wasn't very popular as no one had really noticed it, but once it was noticed by more people, it gained a lot more popularity by people who were, you know, curious as to what this is, and by people who also wanted to figure out, you know, what this all meant, of course. I'm not sure if the creator made the subreddit public from the start or later, though it makes sense that they did it later because, you know, how would people discover it if it was private? Anyway, the subreddit was private and only a select few people were allowed in. Though this only made people more curious than another subreddit called Solving A858 was created. 
Later, the main A858 sub was opened up again, but as of now, it's back to private. Some of the codes were broken by people, and for a while, they were pretty vague and didn't seem to have, you know, a main theme there, or like a main pattern going. Later, it seemed that the creator was having a bit of an AMA through their code. Some questions were asked and some were even answered. Though, sometime later, it was announced that the project had ended. Later, though, a post revealing that two users named you slash eat head, I think, and you slash Fraglet, I'll just say it as that, I don't want YouTube to accidentally do something. Uh, anyway, they were able to contact the creator of A858. They said that the creator was paid by a company to post these things. The creator and the company's identities weren't released. This is pretty weird because it could mean anything. It could have just been a person posting random things to mess with people, just have fun. Or maybe it really was a company and maybe their purpose was to test like an encryption product software thingy. I don't know what to call it. Um, but maybe to see, you know, how, their, how well their encryption was, basically. Maybe it was that, because they could pay people to do this as well, but releasing it to the public would have been more effective since there would have been more people involved, maybe, probably. Plus, it's probably cheaper as well. It's definitely an interesting one, though. I feel like everyone's heard of Amelia Earhart, the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic. What I didn't know, however, is that she disappeared. To be honest, that's probably just me, though. Anyway, what happened is that she was trying to set another record, I think. She was trying to be the first woman to fly all around the world and went missing on the longest leg of that passage, along with her navigator, on July 2nd, 1937. They believe that happened, but they never found any bodies, debris, or anything, hence the disappearance. They tried to find them for decades but never succeeded to. However, many believe that it's most likely that they crashed somewhere near Howland Island. So this one is pretty popular and was also made into a movie called The Exorcism of Emily Rose. My aunt actually recommended it to me saying it's like the scariest movie she ever saw. I saw it, it, was, it wasn't really that scary to be honest. Though it mainly took an inspiration from these events rather than make it like a biopic, the movie. So um, back to the actual story, she was a person from Germany. When she was younger, uh, at 16, she experienced a seizure and was diagnosed with psychosis caused by temporal lobe epilepsy. Shortly after, she was also diagnosed with depression. It seems this or maybe something else caused her mental state to worsen over time because at 20, she reported hearing voices and all, and even after taking medication, it worsened and she became suicidal as well. After treatment for another five years, her family was convinced she was possessed by a demon, so they tried to get her an exorcism, but they were rejected. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, this was kind of happening in the 70s, so it might add some sense to why the parents thought an exorcism was a better idea than actual treatment or whatever. Yeah, but later they got two bishops to get permission to do it. So being the rational parents they were, they stopped seeing the doctor and started seeing priests instead. This didn't result in anything better. After 67 exorcism sessions, she died of malnutrition and dehydration. Which is just sad because that happened in her parents' care. I mean, it happened because of her parents. Fortunately, the parents and the priests were found guilty of negligent homicide. Unfortunately, they were only sentenced to six months in jail, which was later reduced to like three years of probation, which is such a weak punishment. Unfortunate. So... I feel like most of you already know about this because of the whole Logan Paul situation. But anyway, it's a forest where a lot of people, you know, do something unfortunate. The main reason seems to be that it's such a lush forest that it'll be hard to find the bodies and people estimate that over a hundred people, you know, do something unfortunate there every year. So there's probably a lot of unfound bodies. This being the case, many people also believe it's haunted and that the spirits of the people who passed away in the forest are vengeful and dedicated to luring those who uh, are sad off the paths. This one seems quite interesting. It really uh, freaked me out. So in September of 2007, at the age of 14, Andrew Gosden left his home in Doncaster, South Yorkshire, which drew 200 pounds from his bank account that's equivalent to around $338.44 today. He used that money to buy a one-way ticket to London from Doncaster Station, and you know, he probably had some Romanian course. The last time he was seen on CCTV camera was leaving King's Cross Station, which is in London. Till today, people still don't know why he left or where he is. However, last year in 2021, detectives investigating the case arrested two guys on suspicion of kidnapping and human trafficking in relation to his disappearance, and were later released under investigation. 
They were also the first to harass me in relation to this disappearance. In terms of his personal life, it didn't seem too bad from what's publicly known. His parents were Christian, but they didn't baptize their kids because they didn't want to force their views on them. He also didn't leave the house much. Gosling was super smart. He was a prize winning mathematician who had a 100% attendance rate. He also had a small group of friends and didn't seem to get bullied either. Prior to the disappearance, his parents asked if he wanted to travel alone to visit his grandmother in London over the summer, but he said no. And it's not like he didn't like visiting his grandmother or anything, because from what's known, he actually did like visiting them. And a few days before the disappearance, he broke his normal schedule twice, where he walked back home from school instead of taking the bus, which would have been a four mile walk. And the evening before he disappeared, everything was uh, normal. On the morning of his disappearance, he had a difficulty waking up and seemed irritated, which was unusual. After leaving the house, instead of heading to school, he went to cash out money at the ATM. He cashed out 200 of 214 pounds in his bank account because they only allowed it in increments of 20s. After that, he went back home to change out his uniform into more casual clothes and to pick up some things like his wallet, keys, and a PSP. He also left 100 pounds that he got his gift money and his passport at home. After that, the events I stated at the beginning happened to him and he was never seen again. I don't know what happened to him, where he is, if he's still alive or anything. I just hope that he's fine, though. I don't know. It's just, it's just kind of scary to think about, of, you know, what happened to him. So I'm pretty sure everyone knows about Annabelle, but this isn't about the movie. It's about the real life story of it. So first off, she looks way different than the movie counterpart. So the actual story behind it is that it was a gift to a nurse named Donna from her mother on her 28th birthday. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention once again, but this is happening in the 70s. Uh, anyway, Donna liked it a lot and brought it back to her apartment that she was rooming with another nurse named Angie. They kept it as like an accessory on their couch, but noticed that it would sort of move around on its own. They then started finding notes around the house saying help me on parchment paper, which they didn't even have at home. Another crazy story is that Angie's boyfriend heard rustling in Donna's room when she was out so he went in to check what it was and saw the doll laying face down on the floor. Then he felt a searing pain on his chest and as he checked what it was he saw bloody claw marks ran across it, which disappeared two days later. After many incidents they called over a medium who is basically someone who claims they can contact the spirit world. The medium said that the doll was possessed by a 7 year old girl named Annabelle Higgins. She said that the spirit wasn't that bad and just wanted to be loved and cared for. They felt bad for it and let it stay, but according to Ed and Lorraine Warren, paranormal guys that would come later to help them, that was a mistake, and it wasn't a benevolent spirit. They later ordered an exorcism and took the doll and kept it in their occult museum. Okay, so I did my research on this for a while and I still barely understand what it is. So it's a wooden chest covered in gold with a lid with these two people on top called the mercy seat. It's the most sacred relic of the Israelites. A lot of people wanted it, so it was stolen, returned, passed on and all. So I suppose the unexplained part about it is the whereabouts today, since there are several possible places where it could be, and apparently it vanished back in uh, 587 BC. I won't lie, I thought this was going to be about that creepy babushka lady video, but it's actually about something pretty interesting. So this one is talking about an unidentified lady that was at the JFK assassination. Not just that, but it suggested that she may have photographed or filmed the events as well since she had a camera. What's crazy is that even after President Kennedy was shot, she was still holding up the camera like Rose committed. They didn't really identify her, but in 1970, a lady named Beverly Oliver told a conspiracy researcher that she was the babushka lady. She said she filmed the events on her Yesica, Yesica? I don't know how to say it, sorry, Super 8 camera and gave the footage over to two guys who said they were FBI agents. They said they would return the film to her in 10 days, but they didn't and she never reached out either. I mean, I don't blame her I suppose. She also talked about it on a documentary in 1988. And they confronted her with the fact that the Yasika Super 8 camera was made in 1969, nearly 6 years after the assassination, to which she responded that she got an experimental version. Mm-hmm. Okay, I know everyone's heard of this, but what you might not know is that it's also called the Devil's Triangle. At least I didn't know about that. I don't know, maybe you did, but I didn't. Anyway, it's an area in the North Atlantic Ocean, kind of east of Florida and north of the Caribbean islands. It's known for having a lot of sea vessels and airplanes go missing, but apparently many reputable sources say that there isn't really a mystery to this area. Being so well known for being dangerous, there are also claims that there's paranormal activity in the area like leftover technology of Atlantis causes abnormal behavior or that there are ghost ships and UFOs in the area. 
There are also some natural explanations as to why this area is infamous. First is compass problems. Some theorize that there's unusual magnetic anomalies in the area, but it's never really been proven. The other is the Gulf Stream, kind of like a river in the middle of the ocean which can cause things to kind of float away. Violent weather is another one because the area is known for having pretty violent weather. There are a few other ones, but these are the main ones. So this one is about a woman named Elizabeth Short who was found murdered in LA in 1947. And yes, the LA Noir case was based on this one. One of the reasons it was so publicized was the gruesome nature of the murder. I can't go too into detail with it, but she was cut in half and more. She was from Boston but moved to LA to make it in Hollywood. So shortly prior to the murder, she returned from a trip to San Diego with her boyfriend who then dropped her off at the Biltmore Hotel to meet her sister who was in town to visit her. A bit later, she was seen at 754 South Olive Street, a bit under half a mile away from the hotel. So six days later, her body was found um, lacking the creations we make out of cloth, severed in two pieces in Leimert Park, a neighborhood which was about six miles away from the hotel. The autopsy revealed that she was killed that morning or the evening before. So it's quite mysterious where she was gone for so many days prior to that. About six days later, the police got a call from someone claiming to be the killer, saying he would eventually turn himself in, and also said they should expect some souvenirs from Beth Short. Elizabeth Short for short, I suppose. By that, I thought he was going to send over body parts or something. But three days later, a postal worker discovered a suspicious letter, here's Dahlia's belongings, letter to follow, and cut out letters from newspapers, magazines, and such and some of Elizabeth's personal belongings. Her birth certificate, business cards, photographs, names written on pieces of paper, and an address book with the name Mark Hansen on the cover were found. Mark Hansen was noted as a suspect. He was a wealthy nightclub and theater owner. Uh, apparently Mark hit on her and she turned him down, which could have been motivation. Anyway, there wasn't enough evidence and they weren't able to find any leads or anything, so it turned out to be a cold case. So most people already know what this is as well. You know, I feel like I should stop saying that now because we're literally at the top of the iceberg. So that's the whole point. Anyway, I looked into it more to see if there's like some mystery behind it or like a case, but no. So maybe the creator of the iceberg is just talking about, you know, what we all know about already. The most popular example being the saying that a flap of a butterfly's wing can result in a hurricane, thus being the name of the effect. You know, I don't know why I'm saying thus unironically, thus, hence, and all that stuff in a casual YouTube video. I've been writing too many essays lately. To add on a bit, it reminded me of kind of a scary short story read in my high school freshman English class. In this world, they created time machines and one company had a dinosaur hunting tour. They had a strict path that the guests had to follow and only hunted dinosaurs that were about to die so it doesn't affect anything. Anyway, this one guy goes on the tour and he had a big ego so after shooting the dinosaur, he wanted to go and touch it and he was obviously told not to. Yet he went anyway. He obviously had to go out the path to do it and after getting caught the tour guide got very frustrated and worried so they went back to the future early. And as they do, they notice that the language and people around them are all different. It ends there. It's kind of simple but it scared me a bit. And it kind of relates back to the whole uh, butterfly effect thing that a few steps off the trail affected the future that much. And hey, karma for hunting animals. So I found this one really interesting as well. It's pretty scary. So this is about a ship that was found run aground in Cape Hatteras, I think that's how you say it, North Carolina in 1921 with none of the crew found. Going back to an earlier topic, some people think it had something to do with the Bermuda Triangle. Anyway, so on the ship's last voyage, it first sailed from Puerto Rico to Virginia to pick up coal to deliver to Rio. The captain, William H. Merritt, was regarded as a hero, saving his entire crew from a fire when his previous ship was sunk by a German submarine. Back to it. So after leaving Virginia, the captain fell seriously ill, so the ship turned back to Delaware to drop him off and his son. Oh yeah, his son was also aboard the ship, he was the first mate. So after dropping him off, they replaced him with Captain Willis B. Wormel, a retired veteran sea captain, and Charles B. McLellan as first mate. Finally back on track, they sailed to Rio and delivered the cargo with no problems. At the port they got a break cause the captain gave his crew leave and met up with an old friend of his who was also captaining another ship docked. When speaking with him, Wormel said that he didn't like the crew but he trusted the engineer. After leaving Rio, they stopped in Barbados for supplies where the first mate got drunk in town and complained to the captain of another ship that he couldn't discipline the crew without Wormel interfering and had to do all the navigation because Wormel had bad eyesight. So there was uh, tensions rising on the ship for sure. 
He even said, I'll get the captain before we get to Norfolk, I will. Which I suppose he means he's gonna kill him? I don't know. Maybe I'm being too dramatic. Uh, anyway, later he was arrested. Probably for public intoxication, I suppose. But uh, Wormo bailed him out and forgave him. They were next spotted in North Carolina by a lighthouse where the keeper of it heard some guy on the ship with a megaphone shouting that they had lost its anchors in a storm and to notify the ship's owners. He noted it down but he couldn't report it because his radio was down. Three days later the ship was found aground. They couldn't send rescue ships to it either because of the bad weather. So about four days later it was boarded for them to notice it was completely abandoned. The steering equipment was found to be damaged, with the wheels shattered and the rudder broken off. The ship's log and navigation system were gone, along with the crew's personal belongings and the ship's two lifeboats. In the galley, they saw the food was being prepared for the next day's meal at the time of abandonment. There was some speculation as to what had happened and even a note in a bottle found by a fisherman, but he later admitted that he lied trying to get employment. How are you going to get employment from that? Cloud traces in 1921 were different. Some actual reasons thought to be the cause though were bad weather, piracy, mutiny, and of course paranormal activity. It is crazy that they never found the crew either. I feel like maybe something happened causing them to abandon the ship and the lifeboats, and then maybe something happened to them in the lifeboats like a massive wave swallowed them. Oh yeah, so maybe the lifeboats were like sunk in a massive wave that swallowed them or something i don't know this one really is crazy though on january 4th 2012 a fortune user going by 3301 posted an image saying that there was a hidden message to be found in it they said they were looking for highly intelligent individuals and if you found the message it would lead you to finding them after a month they said they found who they're looking for Exactly a year later, a second round was started and a second puzzle was posted. And then finally a third one on January 4, 2014, an exact year after that. And the third one has yet to be solved, allegedly. I don't want to go into this one too much because nearly every YouTuber has made a video about this. And I want to spend more time on things we don't know much about. However, if you do want to see a good video on it, I highly recommend Lemino's video. It is very well made and is very well researched. This one is really creepy. I mean, look at this picture. So the story is that the Cooper family had moved to an old house in Texas and took this picture their first night over there. There was no falling body or anything when they took the picture, of course. But that thing showed up after the picture developed. Most likely it's just fake, some dude probably added it there later. No one ever interviewed that family over this or anything. Could also have been like a mark or something added to there because it developed bad. I'm not sure, I don't know how photos develop and all. Or maybe it really is a ghost, ah. So this is a thing where circles with pretty intricate designs just show up on crop fields. This trend started in the 70s in the English countryside surprisingly. You know normally this stuff always starts with Americans for some reason. Anyway, some people claim it's because of aliens maybe landing their craft or them just making designs for fun. Some people also think it's paranormal stuff. And for some reason, Bigfoot, I know Wendigoon would be proud. <laughs> Whoever most likely it's just people doing this to get their 15 minutes of fame or just to mess around. So this is the last one I'm covering for this video and what a one to end on. So this dude is crazy. In 1971 he boarded a Boeing 727 traveling from Portland to Seattle. Mid-flight he gave a flight attendant a note saying that he was armed with the bomb and that he wanted them to sit by him. Upon doing so he opened the briefcase which had four red sticks, probably dynamite or maybe a bluff. He then stated his demands, which was 200,000, which is over 1.4 million today, and two front and two back parachutes after landing in Seattle. When they landed in Seattle, he let the passengers go after getting the money. After he received the money and parachutes in Seattle, they left, and 30 minutes into the flight, he just jumped out of the plane over southwestern Washington, and to this day, they never identified or found the guy. All we have is that his name on the ticket was Dan Cooper. That could easily just be a lie. I mean, it probably is. Otherwise, they probably would have found this guy, right? And this drawing that probably isn't super helpful because he literally looks like every dude from that era. What's interesting, though, is that he was very calm and collected. He didn't seem to be nervous and he said that he had a grudge. Not against the airlines, but that he had a grudge, which is something that I didn't know, even though I heard about this case a few times. Whew! Well, that's all for this video. I hope you all enjoyed it. And thank you, thank you, thank you very much for checking out my first video on this channel. I really am excited for this channel, like there's so many cool topics and things that I want to cover, and I will, and I hope that you all stick with me and check it out, but once again, thank you, thank you, thank you very, very, very much for checking it out, I love you all, <laughs> alright, bye, have a nice day, I'll see you all soon, bye.